just got up to verse, or we did verse 25 uh, yes, uh, last week. So we're up to verse 26, and I'll just perhaps read that. Um, so 1 Corinthians 14, starting at verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be two or the most high free, and that by course, and that one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Okay, leave it there. Um, verse 26, um, which I'll just read the first part of it here in, in the Bible that I've got in front of me, says, How is it then, brethren? And of course it goes on to talk about um, really what I would call body ministry. Um, you know, one has a psalm, one has a doctrine, one has a tongue, a revelation, interpretation and so on. This is a verse that I completely misunderstood for years. Um, maybe it was because uh, I wasn't reading it properly in context. Maybe it was because um, I just didn't really understand what Paul was saying. But what I think one of the, the main problems with this verse is, is I think it is a translational issue. Uh, the 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 Bible that I used for many years was the, the NIV. And I'll just give you, you how the NIV renders that those first uh, four or five words. In the NIV it says, what shall we say, brothers? Now you see, when you change it from, how is it then, brethren, to, what shall we say, brothers? It takes away any kind of sense of criticism. What the Apostle Paul is doing here is he's actually summing up the, the you know, in, in chapters 12 and 13 he's been telling you how spiritual gifts should be exercised, how you should use them. He's talked about being part of a body, hasn't he? The hand and the eye and so on. They're all different parts of the body but there's only one spirit. Uh, he's, he's, he's dealt with all kinds of things. He's dealt with schisms in the body and so on. And now he's summing it all up. And so what in effect he's saying is, it, having told you all this, how is it then, brethren? In other words, why is it then that when you come together, this happens? That's really what he's saying. But can you see from, from the version that I've been reading for years that just said, what shall we say, brothers? That unless I put it in that context of all those previous chapters, I just think he's saying, uh, hey, I'm, I've got something to say to you. You know, and this is it. So it's lost on me for years. And, and I thought, well, I wonder what, I wonder what some of the other uh, translations have to say. So I literally just pulled them off my shelf at home. I've got, I've got some modern translations. And I just pulled them off my shelf, one after the other, and just checked. I said, you know, what does it say? So this is just in order. Just give you a few of them. Uh, New Living Translation says, well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarise. Uh, the, the REB, Revised English Bible, says, to sum up, my friends... And uh, the NRSV, which I think is probably the worst rendering of this verse, is what shall be done then, my friends? Because that sounds like he's about to endorse, he's about to tell you what you should be doing. Um, the, the, the thing that Paul picks on um, in the second part of verse 26, that one of you should have a psalm, one should have a doctrine, one should have a tongue, he's not saying it's wrong for that to happen. He's not saying, you know, oh no, you shouldn't have one having a tongue, you shouldn't have one having a tongue. What he's talking about is the way in which those gifts are used, you know, the manner in which they are being 
uh, ministered. But I, that was completely lost on me for years. And I do think it, it was down to having a translation that had de-emphasized that critical aspect that Paul was saying, you know, look, I've told you this and I've told you that, but when you're coming together, how is it then? You know, why is it then that you are you are ministering the gifts in such a way that is that is the exact opposite in which uh, they should be they should be ministered? How is it, brethren? How come, after all that I've taught you, that this is um, that this is happening? Okay, so what is happening? Just go back into to verse 23 there of chapter 14. Paul says this, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Everybody all speaking in tongues, all speaking different languages, all simultaneously, will not people say they're mad? And, and of course, Matthew covered that last week. Um, but, but why is this an issue? Why, why is Paul uh, talking about this, this criticism of everybody bringing their particular gift? Well, the answer is because the, they were bringing these gifts which are from the Lord and yet they were, they were delivering them, if you like, simultaneously. Not, not, maybe not exactly simultaneously, but they were talking over one another. You know, so one would deliver one gift and then somebody else might have a gift of tongues and somebody else might have a teaching, but they weren't waiting for one another. They were just speaking out, just saying it. And, um, and, and, and I thought if, it, if it's all right, if it you know, isn't offensive to anybody, that just as a little experiment, um, Matthew, I wonder if you would mind reading verse 22 and, and, and I'll read verse 23. And we'll read those two verses simultaneously and just see uh, what the effect is. Because this, is, this actually illustrates an important, important point here. Okay, so I'll do a one, two, three, go, okay? One, two, three, go. Where if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and not, all speak but talk, the same, so and there come in those that are not, unlearned them, or unbelieving, believe. will they not say that you are mad? It kind of makes you brain pickle doesn't it well can you imagine a church full of people doing that all different things some in unknown tongues some in in the language that people would understand it's just getting lost isn't it whatever god wants to say is just being completely um lost now why would they do something like that why would the corinthian church think that that is an acceptable way to proceed well if you cast your mind back to when we first started 1 Corinthians, and you remember we did that big overview of 1 Corinthians, and I said there's three main kind of cultural issues that, that come through Corinthians. One was the pagan influence, uh, they'd been idolaters and so on. The other was the influence of Greek philosophy, which was very big at that time. And the other was the, this influence, this idea of Roman citizenship and a citizen's rights and so on. And I think what we're seeing here is the influence of two of those particular points. One is, and I'll, I'll sort of deal with them in order, the first is the pagan influence of spirituality. They had a cultural bias in Corinth to this, that, that was their background, okay? So they'd come from this pagan um, and idolatrous background. Pagan spiritual gifts were, uh, if we can put it this way, like, like sort of trance-like possessions, you know. When somebody spoke under the influence of a, of a, of a deity in, in ancient Greece, uh, quite often they would go into a trance, uh, the words would just be coming, they wouldn't have any control over what was being said. Um, and so, so I think the temptation for them is to interpret spiritual gifts as, oh yeah, spiritual things, the Spirit's going to speak through me, and maybe there's a temptation to think, oh, it's like that. Now, I'm not saying whether it was genuinely the Holy Spirit, or, or maybe their own flesh, or maybe even worse. But, but there's a temptation to think, oh yeah, that's how it is. And, and Matthew Henry comments, he says, Divine inspirations 
are not like the diabolical possessions of heathen priests, violent and ungovernable, but are sober and calm. And so this, this, what Matthew Henry is saying is, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes to speak for a person, it's not like the, the old pagan uh, uh, spirituality where the person goes into this trance and they just have no control over it. And this really, I don't know, makes me think when I see, I mean, it's having seen and having been present at some church gatherings where, uh, let's say, when the woman says, oh, the Holy Spirit's moving, you think, well, is it closer to, to that, paganism, where people seem to be out of control, you know, shaking uncontrollably or, or you know, just kind of shouting out these, these, these words and phrases, or is it more like Matthew Henry is describing, is it sober, is it calm? You know, because the, the, the fruit of the Spirit involves um, um, self-control, or it, it, it involves, um, what's, the, uh, what's, what's the old English word for that, I used to, temperance, yeah. You know, the holding of the passions and, and that sort of thing. That is really, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, there is a soberness, there is a calmness, uh, and it, it is, does not involve this kind of mad frenzy uh, that you see. And I, and I, I appreciate is the extreme end of charismatic uh, worship. There are many Pentecostals who are actually quite traditional and quite, you know, closer to the evangelical church. So I know it's not everybody who's, who's like that, but there are some uh, fringe elements that we, we must be aware of and must, must warn about that when the Holy Spirit comes, that's not what it's like. You know, there, there is a sobriety in the people who are bringing these gifts of the Spirit. They are not out of control, as we'll see in just a moment. Okay, um, the other influence that's here in Corinth, or the other temptation that they have here in Corinth, is the influence of Greek philosophy and Greek teachers who would gather little groups around themselves uh, they, you know, they'd, they'd all have their own little group and so on and that would be your teacher and you'd follow them and I don't know if you, you picked up on this when me and Matthew did that, that sort of chaotic talking over one another but if you imagine you had a room full of people all doing that what tends to happen is because your ear can't listen to all that and, and take it all in you tend to maybe focus on one of the voices or you know, you'll, you'll think, oh, I just listened to this person then. And I think that's what's happening here. I get the feeling from, from what you know, we've read so far with this talk that Paul talks about schisms and so on and, and, and separating away. And remember at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, it talks about I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. You know, he said, this is what you like. You know, I am of Kephas. Um, so they have this temptation to be uh, what we would call partisan, or, or have a party spirit, you know, like, you know, oh, I'm of this group, no, I'm of that group. And because this is already in their cultural makeup, when stuff like this starts going on, people are saying, oh, well, I'm with this group, group over here, I'm listening to this teacher, or well, I'm listening to that teacher. There's not a unifying uh, uh, element to it. Instead, the opposite happening, it's actually causing divisions. People are crowding around various teachers and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow this teacher, I'm going to follow him, I'm going to... Uh, 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 become part of that sort of party and so Paul reminds us at the end of 26 let all things be done unto edifying now we said it before edifying is building up uh, where we get the word edifice from which is a building but you know what are people what are the church being edified into what are we being built up into is it not a temple to the Lord are we not living stones that are built together one another being brought together. You can picture that. You know, there's a unity in the in the work when the when the gifts of the spirit start to edify the church, they bring unity. The unity of the spirit. Remember that you know that Psalm Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, it should bring a unity. Uh, between those who have the Holy Spirit. That's the only kind of unity you can have is with other Christians. Uh, whereas what was going on in Corinth uh, that Paul is detailed was having the opposite effect 
there was disunity and discord coming out of it um, because the way that these gifts were being uh, used. So, there are supernatural gifts that come from God, but there are also rules that the church uh, then, then exercises and you know the people in the church must apply these rules and just to kind of go through some of them now this is this is fairly straightforward uh, verse 27 uh, is really saying that no more than two or three people are to speak in an unknown tongue in a meeting and that by course by course means you know one after the other um, not not simultaneously and again you will go to certain charismatic meetings I've been in them I've participated in them even and you know everybody will be praying out loud at once or will be speaking in tongues at once to me that, that is a, a complete contradiction of what Paul is saying here Paul's saying no it, it, it's one after the other it is by course um, However, if there is no interpreter, then the speaker of tongues should be silent and simply use his gift in his own or her own private times with the Lord. Um, now, I would add that it may be possible for someone who speaks in tongues to have the interpretation himself. Uh, but it doesn't actually say that, so I, I am in danger of drifting into I think, I think, which I don't want to do, um, but it's clear that if a tongue is spoken and there's no interpretation, it's going to benefit nobody, it's going to edify nobody apart from the person who's, who's given it, so therefore he, he may as well just do that at home. I think that's the essence really of what, of what Paul's saying. Um, it is also uh, clear from the instructions that the, the, the gift of tongues uh, once it's been once it's been given, and, and, it, and it, we know the gift of tongues is not a language that's learned. You know, you don't kind of go through it, and you know maybe the Lord gives you one word one day, and then you know another day you get another word, and then you start. It's not like learning German or French or whatever, where you pick up a few words and then you start to expand your vocabulary. I think it's clear in the scriptures that uh, it's a it's an, a tongue that you haven't learned that God has imparted this tongue to you supernaturally but that I would say that, that, that it becomes clear that the speaker can then afterwards use that gift uh, at will or, or, or when he or you know when he sees fit to use it sort of thing uh, so once once it's been given then you can exercise your will and use it when, when you feel it's it's time to use it or you feel that God is giving you some kind of message in that unknown tongue and then you can exercise it um, so so I mean otherwise it wouldn't have um, the rules that we have here um, if I, verse 27 if any man speak in an unknown tongue let it be by two or at the most three and that by course that one after the other so you have to have control over the gift in order to exercise in that way you know if, if God is saying you know somebody else has given a tongue you must wait then it means that you are able to exercise a certain control over it and then when it's your turn then you can exercise that gift so this is really we're looking at the mechanics of look these are the gifts but how do they work and, and you'll see there are actually quite strict rules governing them, which you don't get in a lot of churches that talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and let's face it, Corinth is one of them, they are one that, that you know, uh, prizes the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, there, there isn't that sense of control, uh, in fact it's often the opposite, it's like, well when the Holy Spirit shows up, there'll be no control, it'll all go out the window, well no it won't, not if it's from God, uh, there are rules, and there are um, uh, commandments and so on so so what what the Holy Spirit brings does not contradict what the Word of God teaches in fact that the one enhances the other okay so from from verse 29 to 32 uh, again 
we've got um, rules uh, guiding how how uh, prophecy can be used. So again, he says, verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. So once again, there there is a there is a number fixed on it. No more than two or three. And again, you can't talk over one another. You've just got to wait your turn. And when it's when you, when it's right to give it, I mean, again, this takes you know I think this takes discernment from the person. If you are given a gift of prophecy and you are able to exercise it, um, you, you if you're giving it in a public meeting, you're giving it in an assembly, you have to be sensitive to what's going on around you. I mean, again, I've been in meetings, I say this because I don't go around looking for people's faults, but uh, you know, the church I got saved in was a Pentecostal church and I spent a long time in Pentecostal and charismatic churches, so I've just been in a lot of meetings where this has gone on. So this is not meant to be a, you know, a, um, a highly critical view of, of, of the Pentecostal church, but I've just been in meetings where this has happened. I've been in meetings where someone's been preaching and someone stood up and given a prophecy or given uh, uh, a message in tongues and the preachers had to shut up and just, you know, the man's given it and, and you know, he's... Now, to me, how is that happening? How is the Holy Spirit, if he's inspired the man to preach and to teach, how is the Holy Spirit saying, right, you be quiet now and now this man's going to speak and, you know, I, I don't see that that... that should be happening really so so again if you are a prophet uh, verse 32 says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets so you know when you've got something to deliver uh, you can if you like sit on it you can wait until the appropriate time uh, I mean it could be there could be you know praise music going on or something like that and you know you, you don't want to just kind of put in there and interrupt all the musicians, maybe wait till it's over, then you can deliver it. Um, this doesn't mean that they're not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it just means that you understand that there are certain rules that govern it. And um, let's just turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, I know I quote it a lot, but it's worth bearing in mind when we're looking at these things, uh, 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, and it's verse, well, we'll start at verse 19. Um, it says this, quench not the spirit. So, that teaches us that you can actually quench the spirit, you can, like a flame, you can put that out. Um, so, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. But what, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So this is what uh, this is what Paul is saying. Yeah, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Let's judge, let's see if it really is of God. Let's see if it lines up with the scriptures. Let's be uh, good Bereans and see whether it really is from God. But the other side is this, don't despise it. Don't just say, ah, oh, what's this rubbish coming out now? You know, I don't like, that's not the way I like to do church. You know, I, I like to know what's coming next. I don't like someone standing up and just saying something. That's not what I'm used to. You know, we have to be careful that we don't quench the spirit. We have to be, you know, I believe these are, these are biblically legitimate gifts. If they are from God and if they are exercised correctly within this system of, of Rules, I don't know why I keep using the word rules, but I can't think of a better one. Rules, guidelines, well, the more than guidelines, the, the, it's the word of God. So, you know, the two must tie in together. The inspiration of the Spirit and the teaching of the word of God must come together and must fit together, like, you know, perfectly, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, they can't, we're not trying to, like, oh, jam them together. No, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit fits into this orderly uh, uh, conduct. Otherwise, it just becomes, as someone once said, charismatic chaos. You know, it really does become chaotic. Uh, and we don't want that. We want, we want 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know that that the fact that there are rules uh, doesn't mean that there is an absence of freedom or that it's legalistic. Uh, the Bible says, "Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty." Um, but what this means is that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He also brings not just gifts, supernatural things, but He also brings with Him order and peace. You know, I mean, look at the lives of individual believers. You know, you find people who have lived really chaotic lives and really uh, uh, sort of anarchistic. Is that the right word? Lives like a, like a, you know, they're just like anarchy. When when they become Christians, they find a new sense of order in their lives, a new sense of you know being able to 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 control things that were previously out of control. And so I think this does come with the Holy Spirit. There is a, an, an order. Uh, there is not a confusion. Uh, in fact, the Bible says, read there in verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So it, in, er, in every church, there is there ought to be not confusion, but order. There ought not to be uh, uh, this chaos, but there ought to be uh, peace. And, um, you know, just like in the universe, we have a God who is the author of order. There are uh, laws of physics, aren't there? There are laws that govern uh, the moving of, of the planets. And, you know, there are laws that govern uh, uh, such things as uh, we, we were watching a, we watched the Moody, the old Moody uh, science videos and stuff uh, from the, made by the Moody Institute. Uh, they're quite good, though. They are, they are very old now. But it was on the, the, the sort of life cycle of a seed. You know, as a, as a home educator, you get very excited about these things. And uh, the children were just like watching, fascinated as it showed the seed, how it's produced and how, how it's carried by the wind and so on. And, and uh, one of them was a, was a seed from a, from a plant, I think it was in Africa. But the, the, the seed kind of grows. Uh, to an elongated shape and it drops off the tree and into the water and then the water or the river carries it along but what's happening is as it's carried along the bottom half of this if you can picture like a long green stem like the bottom half of it soaks up the water so as it's soaking up the water it gets heavier and so the thing starts to sort of drop down like this and the water's still carrying it along eventually it just hits you know, the earth or the sort of sandbank or whatever, it stops and it starts to sprout its roots and then it actually grows up through the river and they and they grow, they colonise and they form their own little islands. I mean, it was just amazing, you know, to think that God has designed it so perfectly. But he's done that because he's a God of order. You know, there is an order and a method and a means in which, you know, God's creation uh, works and fits together. and same with the church. There is an order in the church. Uh, there are certain laws and stuff that are to be practiced in the church. It's not just like a sort of, you know, a great big hippie loving, you know, where we all hug each other and, you know, no it isn't. It, there are, there's order and there is, you know, things that go on. Uh, we have the liberty of the Holy Spirit, praise God. It's not dry, dead you know, uh, uh, legalistic, there is freedom within it, but there is an order. And I think that's what we have to appreciate in these verses and in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. And I think it's going to set the, the tone for the rest of the, you know, for the verses we're going to be looking at next week is this understanding that there is an order. Uh, whilst we still have freedom and we still have the liberty of the Holy Spirit, there, there are rules and there is an order.